think we're good. Yeah, Should awesome. We take a minute and talk about freelance focus. Yeah, yeah. To go. That's what I was going to do, John. Oh, Just, bless you, John. And Aaron, you're on. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, with that lovely intro, uh, John, myself, and Matt Natola, I'm not sure if he's on the call today, but we decided to launch a newsletter. So it's called Freelance Focus. I'll drop the subscribe link in the channel here. But really, we just felt that there was so much future of work news out there on so many different platforms, and not all of them really related directly to the freelance economy where most of us are working. So we wanted to basically go, we read all this shit all the time anyways, and we're going to sift through it and we're going to send you what we think is interesting, leverage a lot of the voices that are in this room, see what's happening on the ground, talk about what's happening in specific countries and how that might be different, and really just aggregate, synthesize and connect everybody together. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we would love to hear feedback. It's very early days. So we want to shape this to be valuable to our readers and uh, ultimately, good, bad or ugly, just let us know. Fantastic. Awesome. And I believe it's not going to be bad and ugly. I think it's a beautiful thing. And Erin is our Aaron is our editor, which means that she raised her hand and said, I'll put this thing together with your support. And you know, it, I I did not know that this was a talent of hers, but it obviously is. It looks very good. It's very interesting stuff. I'll write special stuff for every one of the issues. We've got some really interesting people that are also suggesting news and, and we need all of you una hurley if you're not telling us the news from ireland come on oh so well please. you know the, the most important piece of news for us in ireland is that it's march and of course <laughs> you know what that means yeah uh, not only uh are we coming up to saint patrick's day we're all oh going my. to go crazy but we're having a very special guest to Ireland in Bless you. John Younger and his wife were coming to Ireland and Peter and I are so excited because we're going to be accepting um, a fantastic uh, honor and um, we're, we're really, really psyched about that. We're, we're hopefully going to have a, a nice group of people coming along to welcome you and Carol and John. So, uh, yeah, we're really, really excited and very grateful. Thank you. And John Windsor, you yes, and sir. Barry and Tom have really been the kickoff for this trusted talent plat platform partner. I can say that without giggling. A and and it's the first time, Una, that, that on a mass scale, we've really found 13 very basic and important questions to ask people you get some sense for how well we're delivering to our clients. And, you know, if if, if Open Assembly is the, the town square of the freelance revolution, we're going to we're going to need this to make sure that 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 becomes a reality in a very strong sense. And guys like Len Hodgson know better than anybody else how important it is to have a perspective on who's doing well. So many new platforms don't have the money to advertise, but they need to show that they can break through with their brand. Mm -hmm. This is something that can help them break through. So we we think it's gonna be very good for new platforms. And may I say that the leader of this, more than anything else is Tom Matthews at this point. So I think I think Barry is, as, uh, has done a very, very good job <laughs> in creating the, the next manager of open assembly tools, including the, T2P2. Awesome. Thanks, John. That's a really great announcement. Hey, Marcus, you shot a note to us in the in the chat. Just want to introduce yourself that you're new too. And sorry we didn't get to you. No, uh, I missed that. I missed the train. Sorry. So no I live here. So I was invited by Marcelo Magalhães, who is here. And uh I'm very happy to be here. And I'm a creative base. I'm executive creative director. Uh, worked for CPB, lived in Boulder for two years in the past. <coughs> Right, and then, man. C and then CCB alumni, exactly. Yeah, and CPB Miami as well. Uh, and then our Air 23 and the community. So nowadays, oh, working as a you know, with my own hub, uh, partnering with Marcelo in some projects. So, pretty happy to be here. Great, yeah, great, cool. Thank and then, Brandon, I know you have some announcement as well. Yeah, just a couple things. Um, Barry and, 
and John Younger are going to be speaking at the Flexible Workforce Summit in Copenhagen. It's on um, March 29th, and I have a discount code, if I can find it, to anybody who would like to attend. I'll put that in the chat. Um, and then I don't know if you've seen, but we have a couple campaigns going on through you know, on social media. It's Freelancers of the World and a chart of the week. So if you have any content that you'd like to contribute to this, we're trying to highlight freelancers, what they're doing out there, um, success stories, and um, we can also showcase your platform as well. And then chart of the week is us taking research we're seeing out there, charts, graphs, um, graphics, and putting the OA brand on them, but then pushing them out through our, our channels. So if you have anything to submit, just send it our way. We'd love to to put it up there. And Ashley, I don't know if you're paying attention, but I wanted to call on you and just make sure people know that you're helping with um, guests and scheduling out guests in the future and, and things like that. So if you wanna maybe say a couple things, um, I'll pass the mic to you. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah, and this is so timely. I just talked to Henry at Wazoku about this in our breakout. Um, so thank you, Henry. If there's anyone you come across who you think would be a great guest or feature, um, like a spotlight, someone who's doing really cool things in this space, someone who, um, or a company or a leader who is talking about something that no one else is talking about that should be here um, to talk about here in the space, please send them my way. We are looking for guests um, for the second half of this year. So I appreciate anyone you want to send. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Ashley. All you All right, should we jump into it. Let's do it. Yeah. So, you know, I, I know like the rest of you guys, we've we've all been kind of blown away or amazed by the whole generative AI stuff. Bology and I've spent a lot of time talking about that. I want to just start, you know, off with one story that I that I had the other day here in Boulder that just just totally blew my mind. You know, certainly on the content creation, it's really interesting. And I've written some stuff on my blog about it. And, and, um, but I think there's much deeper implications. And so, uh, you know, and I, I'm sure all of us agree, and that's what I kind of want to talk about today. I, I, a local uh, CTO that I've known for a while over a few companies said that he, you know, was using, I don't know if it, everybody's experienced um, the GitHub Copilot, you know, software essentially helps software engineers complete, you know, software, you know, as they write it. So, you know, using generative AI, specifically chat GPT, because it's a Microsoft product to do that. And he said that he was working on a, a new kind of building some new software on top of a new platform that had come out. But instead of using and reading the, the manual and, and the FAQs, he decided just to start by using the, you know, the GitHub Copilot. And so he started and he, he worked on his first, you know, piece of the software and, and it worked well. And the second worked really well. And it's just blowing him away. Right? <laughs> Being able to use the generative AI to, to help him create these, these solutions. By the time he got to the fifth one, he wrote the software on top of the platform that he was writing on and the software didn't work. And he was really confused. So he went back and analyzed the software he and, and, and the Copilot had written and it had all the characteristics it should have worked. So he called the company of the base software and said, hey, here's my experience for, you know, successful uses of ChatGPT to help me generate this and it works really well on your platform. Here's the fifth one, you know, it doesn't seem to work. And they they looked at the code together and the guy from the company said, oh my God, like that, that's some base functionality we haven't created yet. Generative AI predicted what we've got on our roadmap six fronts, months from now and created software that will work when we get that base, a, the base, you know, the base technology built. And so the ability to kind of predict what's going to happen and be able to operate in that, that manner. So I thought that was just such an interesting story of, of the potential of, of all this. Um, Balaji and I've had a lot of, lot of great conversations and Balaji, I wanted you to kick this off because now you're remitted Deloitte is to look at this whole space and you come from the talent space. And, and so you have a unique position or at least, a unique perspective um, of being, you know, in our space for a long time and now looking at AI and ML across the Deloitte organization. So you, why don't you kick us off and, and tell us kind of how, how you see these two fields merging and where the where the rubber meets the road. Now I know we've got Josh and Tom and a bunch of other folks that have really been playing with the technology as well. 
Yeah, and I think you know there are there are um, as I as I think about it, fundamentally, as in the example that you just mentioned, uh, John, let's take it from two perspectives, right? Just from two users. One of the users is, is your friend who's actually trying to build something. Let's say in the world when ChatGPT or generative AI in general didn't exist, they needed somebody, whether it's in their employee or a freelancer, to do that work. Mm-hmm. Now, with so to get to the outcome, that picture behind you is freaky. I'm, I'm, I keep watching it, John, but we'll ignore that for now and we'll get back to it later. Um, but the uh, it is a question of that somebody has to spend X amount of effort pre-generative AI to get to that outcome. And post-generative AI, that effort compression happens, right? There's a significant effort compression. And right now, let's say for companies, any company in a services knowledge worker space like us, we're thinking about what is the impact of that effort compression, more so in cases where people are getting paid for the effort. Like if your friend had contracted with a freelancer to pay, to get to pay him or her a thousand hours to get to the build out that software, the next version of that software, mm-hmm. with a co-pilot type of a model, your your friend would expect to pay less to that freelancer, assuming that the freelancer is gonna use the generative AI to get to that outcome. In that, so now if you take that view, what is that effort compression and how much impact is that gonna create on freelancers, right? I mean, that is clearly a top line revenue going down for them as we expect that. Um, Yeah. Is just, sorry. Yeah. Second is just thinking about the role of the freelancing marketplaces in facilitating that better outcome, right? Right now, generative AI and freelance marketplaces live in their own silos. I haven't seen a single press release perspective from any of the freelance marketplaces or open talent to say, this is what we think about the impact of generative AI on freelancers. And this is our plan to mitigate that impact. They're not. So all of it lands on the user's head that they now have to compute that and they are you know, having to deal with this, with this friction where in many ways in their mind, generative AI and freelancers are competing with each other versus augmenting it. I think the, the end game of this has to look, it, I don't see open AI or any of the stable diffusion or any of the generative AI companies getting into freelancing. But it is possible that freelance marketplaces can actually embed generative AI into their, make friends with it, bring it in so that if I'm a client and I'm trying to do some research or some code development, the freelance marketplace based on the scope that was that was put into the request should be able to say, 30% of your work of this code development can happen on generative AI. We have all the large language models or the transformers in the back end. We will generate that first round of code and we'll have an expert freelancer that knows how to modify that code to get you to the outcome. A freelance marketplace then monetizes that first model and the freelancer then gets to finish it. Better outcome for everybody, but it takes a complete redefinition of what open talent thinks of itself. If open talent thinks of itself as people centric, then it will fight it. If open talent thinks of it as a deliverable, deliverable centric, the work centric, it'll it'll embrace it. Mm-hmm. But it's going to take a significant um, mindset shift, not just from freelance marketplaces, by the way. Every consulting company has to go through the same understanding of how does generative AI augmentation impact effort, and what does the new business model look like, where in specific skill set areas. Generative AI will make a significant impact in how clients think of value of the intermediary or of the skilled resource. Yeah, great. That's great, Paul. Do you, let me, uh, Robert, I'm going to get to you. And I think there's there's something here, you know, that Dave said something super important, you know, Dave Messenger did in, in the chat, if you can see that, the GitHub stats that are states that developers are using Copilot generate 40% more lines of code in the same time as developers without Copilot. 
So something to contemplate and really aligned with, you know, what you were saying, it's like the enablement layer, right? Right, Balaji. Hey, Robert, you got your hand up, so I'll, I'll jump to you. Hi, I was hoping just to listen, but that last piece was really interesting. Um, there was a freelance, and I think it's still around, marketplace called Gigster. Yes. That yeah. went heavy into that. Uh, they actually got investment from Andreessen Horowitz. They went deep, deep, heavy into, we're going to build out the platform that everybody is going to use first. Um, I actually had the opportunity to work with two projects that worked in that same model. And it was very interesting from a pricing standpoint and from a selling standpoint as to how they pitched that to their clients. Um, it ended up being a total disaster, primarily because the code itself was not ready, right? And the overcommitment from the sales side was too high. And so I think the interesting piece in that is we can see this coming. It's been on the horizon for many, many years, but how you manage that expectation and then what does the follow on look like, especially when you need to get specializations, right? Because generalized technologies have a tendency to be at one level. And then the business usually has some level of specificity that requires some uniqueness. And so I think communicating that balance and managing that's a really important piece, but it's a great observation and it's interesting to see it come up so quickly again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it's a great point, Robert. No, and it also makes me think about, you know, the kind of, for, for me, in my experience, you know, Open Talent started as, as outcome-based crowdsourcing, right? Like if I needed, when I was at Victors and Spoils and I needed, you know, a solution, I would put it out to my, to my 10,000 people in, in, on my team and, you know, a few hundred would lean in and and there would be some interesting solves and we'd buy the outcome. So it didn't really, you know, we, and it would be the best outcome, right? And I think that's, I wonder if that model is going to going to start to emerge again, instead of buying inputs, you know, freelancers, it's buying outcomes that are freelancers plus tools like generative AI. And it'll be more than one that you can choose from to get away from not that, that kind of uh, expectations gap. Hey Josh, I know you're working in this in this area. This area. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm new to all this stuff. Um, you know, especially the talent and, and kind of HR space. And uh, like we were talking the other day, Windsor, we we started implementing the OpenAI API for just trying to figure out how to help our customers with our platform uh, drive more and become more skills based. And uh, there I have a couple of interesting thoughts on it. You know, I think. We, we believe the future is being skills-based and then it doesn't really matter if that is gig economy, consulting people from the outside, working on projects or the internal team, but really, you know, the internal team or the external team, if you're driven by skills, then the job role kind of doesn't matter as much anymore. And it's sort of the old way of, of being. And, um, you know, I think it's going to be a really, really long time before job roles are deprioritized. But if you think about it, it's, it's sort of an antiquated way of managing a team. And um, Balaji, I think it's really interesting. Deloitte has, uh, there's a, a study that came out of Deloitte, um, I'm sure you're aware of, but it's a, a long uh, position piece on skills-based organizations. There's a bunch of really incredible data in there. But you know, very few of the, of the it was, I think it was like 12,000 um, execs were were um, interviewed for this piece. And, you know, very few uh, think that their organizations are doing a good job with skills and, and kind of managing the skills of their workforce. But almost all of them say managing skills of the workforce is really the wave of the future. And so we were kind of thinking about this and and um, my my business partner and I, the, the guy that I bought the company from, uh, he... He's, uh, he's been in this market for 15 years and, and you know, he's, there's this thing that a lot of you are probably familiar with that the federal government puts out called ONET and ONET sort of the end all be all, um, you know, job role kind of uh, state of the, of the world from, from the way that the federal government looks at it. And, and so we have the, the, the um, ONET uh, kind of base job roles listing as sort of a starting place for our clients to use, uh, you know, to, to create uh, their instance with skill TV and get, get cranking. And, and it's, you know, it's okay. It doesn't, does its job, you know, for the most part. And we implemented uh, the OpenAI API and ChatGPT, and we we're just kind of playing with it. And we started, you know, with, with a bunch of clients, we're like, hey, let's, let's explore some edge case roles and started basically, you know, looking at what those roles are. And it was coming back with a list of, of skills associated with those job roles that was 50 times better, a hundred times better 
than what was coming out of the federal government. And there's probably a team of 100 people that create ONET. And so it was it was actually a little scary um, and how good it is. And, you know, it's not not quite as, as extensive and, and amazing of an example uh, as, as, you know, building software. But but, you know, creating job roles is one of the, the highest friction points for coming and creating an understanding of, of the organization and, and what are the skills and what is, what's driving it. And so we found like, actually, if we decrease the friction of, of people coming on board to understand and create the job roles and then subsequently all the skills in the organization, if this technology in five seconds of typing roles can, can do what it's doing, I just, you know, the future is just incredibly bright in the space. And, and our goal and our hope is that this helps more companies become skills based and skills driven faster because people you know we believe that that employees and and contractors workers are much happier when they're being respected and they're working on their skills the things they're really good at and not all the boring crap that we all hate and our teams hate to to be working on that have nothing to do with the importance of why they're there in the first place they have to do all this crap and be in meetings and all this you know 80% of stuff that doesn't really matter versus 20% of the skills and so we're pretty excited about where this is where this is going, uh, and and we're just, I mean, we're we're sixty days into the, the exploration here, so yeah, just kind of interesting stuff. Josh, can I ask you a follow up there? I mean, yeah. if you like, I, I see skills based, or at least the the language around skills based, is still um, employee or at least human centric. Yeah. Like there are now generative AI that will create a complete end-to-end -end UI for you or a complete end-to-end -end app interface for you based on user stories that you give them. Yep. At that point in time, the skills per se don't matter, right? And this is, I think, one of the most important things that, you know, when Satya Nadella talks about his $10 billion investment, his whole point is it actually finally brings that you know, chemical engineer that is doing work in a in a oil plant, more value because they were kept away from the IT revolution and the monetization of the IT skills revolution because they didn't have it. With generative AI, they don't need to have those skills to be able to create an outcome based on true industry on the ground skills versus these intermediate IT skills that monetized a lot of the value. I'm worried that our skills-based organization still is keep pivoting to skills that are going to get like development and data science that are going to get disintermediated by, disintermediated by, by generative AI. Yeah, it feels like it feels like it's back to kind of Clay Christensen's jobs to be done, but maybe it's not jobs to be done. It's actually tasks to be done, right? So if you have a task to be done, you can you can take a, you know, you can take a, a job and and then in that or a role and taskify it. And, and maybe there are 25 tasks and 10 of them could be done with generative AI for the outcome, right? So moving from kind of jobs to skills to tasks to outcomes, is, it seems like it's a, an important path to take. Hey, Tom O'Malley, you've been writing a, a bunch about this space as well. Just wanted to get your input as well into this. Yeah, this. no, thanks for that. Yeah, I think what I'm thinking about is um, everything that we're saying is gonna be true. It's just a matter of when. And I think that there's certain layers, like every time you get a new technology that comes in, it immediately has like a, um, almost like a zero sum effect. Like, oh, I'm gonna take away something. Um, but I think the next wave is really the, um, when we start seeing the technology implemented at the application layer. And so what I can share with you guys today is a little bit about what we've been experiencing by integrating AI at our application layer. And then what I think it demonstrates unlocks a tremendous amount of value that goes back to individuals. So I think, um, I think anytime we see tech, we think it's gonna like disrupt us and hurt us. And then we start realizing, wait a minute, with that capability, it's actually gonna open up new opportunities. And I think that that's what we're seeing already just, um, just in the past few months. So if you guys don't mind, can I share my screen for, uh, for a couple minutes here and just talk through exactly how we're leveraging it and seeing the results? Yeah, sure. Okay. So um, just, just for context, gang, um, what we, we think is a big problem is that there's just more and more topics that are expiring at the practitioner level. The pace of research is not keeping up with the pace of change. The time it takes to go capture knowledge from a group of people takes longer than it is relevant. And so there's a big loss there. 
that's the general problem that we see. And you can imagine that if we could apply AI to helping assemble people faster, um, having letting them have just a natural conversation about certain you know, jobs to be done, uh, unmet needs, uh, what, we, what we need to be true about the ideal future. How do we get there? That is so valuable today because it's so hard to capture. And so if we just had a mechanism that was AI powered, right? Put a group of people in an Iron Man suit and get a report published quickly, what would that do? So that's the business that we've been in for a while, but we've been doing it on the custom side. So I'll just skip. So um, we've been in business for seven years. We've done over 600 different groupings of people to produce different outputs of usually market knowledge, like they're you know, a new market, a new unmet need, uh, what needs to be true about a new solution. And so we've, we've done, we've generated thousands of reports with the platform, but we've always been automated and gig enabled. We've never been autonomous. And so that's this next layer. That's why I kind of have a permanent smile now because we've been assembling people, engaging them asynchronously and then producing reports from that. And we've been doing that at a certain, call it a certain, um, uh, efficiency that's been just shy of disruptive, I'd say. Apology and I have done a lot of work together and there's still so much idiosyncratic stuff that occurs in each panel until you can autonomize it and eradicate a lot of that idiosyncrat uh, idiosyncratic stuff. It doesn't really become like rinse and repeat as you'd like it to be or as, as cost effective as you want it to be. So we've been building what we call an AI orchestrator over the past several months. The net net is this, um, from input to output. So from when clients even first start typing their scope, we can use AI to generate an entire scope just from a few sentences, mapping it back to a framework that we, we identify as successful for them. Um, not only that, uh, we can use it to query uh, about like, what are the best tags to go look for applicants for this persona or for this problem? What other personas aren't we thinking about? And so it's so much better than asking the client <laughs> or asking us. Um, so it gets better applicants. It, it helps us source new ones faster, uh, better. When they're engaging, we've replaced the facilitator altogether. We used to pay $3,000 to a facilitator to manage an engagement over a period of say four days an asynchronous discussion. Um, we replaced that with a bot and people can't tell. Uh, we even had somebody, we're hosting a panel right now on AI impacting research. And one of the, one of the panelists just said yesterday, Hey, if you guys were really you know, drinking the Kool-Aid, your facilitator would be a bot. They don't know that the bot actually is being the facilitator. So it's that convincing because, and I'd say because we're not just making chat GPT calls, we're saying, we're giving it the context, the prompt. I'm sure you guys have heard prompt engineer is sort of the new title for how to interact with uh, AI. We've leveraged our 600 engagements to create templates of prompts to then go out to chat GPT with. So when we get a response, it's so much more meaningful. Um, so that's really important. I think people should understand that there's ways to enhance the, the call. Um, and then the other thing that we're doing is we're using it to help distill the conversation and bring out insights that a human may not see, uh, connect ideas, uh, identify who's in agreement, where's the, where's the disagreement. And then it's also being used to then publish the outputs. So already, just in the past couple of months, we've cut our time to inside down. We've reduced our hard cost. We've um, almost doubled engagement because now somebody's reacting to your idea in real time, or it feels like somebody is. And uh, what we're moving to is uh, a scale that's uh, really transformational. Um, and so here's the net, I guess here's the punch to the story is that Without AI, we would have never been able to achieve the scale, which means we would have been stuck in this custom like service business, which is really hard because managing clients, is just not fun. It just takes so much time. So what we're doing is moving to a syndicated model, eroding that cost and opening it up for anybody to come and create a panel on any topic. And it'll probably have some density, maybe AI Web3 for a while. But we believe that every company, every group, any individual, John, you, you could self-organize a panel on any topic just by being the curator. Let those people come together, generate a report, publish it in a marketplace. Maybe it sells for 300 bucks a download, but it sells a thousand times. 
80% of that goes to the panelists and yourself. So we're building a marketplace that we would have never been able to achieve if we weren't able to uh, um, you know, leverage AI for this level of scalability. And when you do the economics on this, a lot more money goes back to the participants than what we're sharing today. So we think the net gain is creating new models, creating new ways to collaborate, augmenting people's behavior, putting them in iron suits so they can create more value with less effort and then monetize that in, in new ways. And that's hopefully what came across here with these slides. Yeah, great, Tom. Now, this is a good, great, great example. I think the thing I kept hearing from you that's super important that I've heard a lot in Bology, you and I, you, you shot me a note on Bology, this idea of prompt engineering, that the, that the real key to this whole thing is like how, you know, what are the questions you ask and, and, yeah. and how do you engage with it, right? Because- But Tom, um, like, I feel like that is even limiting, right? I mean, I feel like there's enough data for you to create AI-based personas. One, let's say if you take the conversation of AI-based research, there's one person, an AI can play the persona of a CXO level executive that is looking for insights. You can create 25 AI personas that can generate all the engagement. I know Karen will say people are important. Yes, they they are important, but if you if the company's output is they want to generate an in, insightful report, I feel like you can train AI to do that engagement. And of course, you can still have people. Well, I, at least what I've been seeing with generative AI, if you and again, that's how people are hacking ChatGPT, which is you ask ChatGPT saying. Can you take on this persona with this expertise now and now answer the questions from that vantage point? It is mind blowing how much it can do that. And John, given how much of your writing is out there, I am sure the AI can talk like you and your perspectives very comfortably. And I think that changes um, the, the amount of engagement, the, the levers that you're showing there, Tom, which will happen whether we want it or not, it is going to happen. Like Reed Hoffman, the guy who does, um, you know, Greylock and co-founder yeah. of LinkedIn, is actually starting a podcast where he basically is having conversation with AI on different topics, yeah. and he thinks that is the most fascinating topics conversations we'll have, where he's just sitting and talking to an AI bot about any topic in the world. It's already happening. So, so just to counter that a little bit uh, is that, I mean, generative AI, guys, is, is content being generated from content. And so it, that will always be its limitation without the introduction of fresh knowledge. I mean, you look at, there was reference to Clay Christensen and what he focuses on a lot is, you know, jobs to be done, of course, which means unmet needs. And unmet needs require human experience, creativity, emotion, biases, attitudes, fears, anticipations, cultural nuance. And yes, I know that, that the AI will be able to mimic what's, what's been available, but given pace of change, I, I believe that you, you still need to introduce the fresh human inputs to know that you're getting something of value. Otherwise you could just be recycling the past. So, but, but I, again, only slightly countering what you're saying. I, I think the human engagement is irreplaceable. Agreed. It's, it, it's interesting, right? Because I, I take the long, long view on this. And, you know, I know a lot of people are worried about what does this mean for people? And, and you know, it's going to replace people. I, I often think of the story of when, you know, when I was in, in junior high, my dad owned a newspaper in Illinois. I think they did a million and a half dollars of revenue. And there were probably 75 people that worked there, 70 people maybe. And, you know, so just very, you know, really small town. But my job was to carry the lead bars from the basement to put it into a machine called a linotype that would smelter the, the lead. And then a woman would take the typewritten copy from the editors and type the, the type into hot lead and then a guy by the name of a typesetter would take that and put it into a you know into a tray and build the newspaper right and i thought that was the coolest thing and and, and every time publishing throughout my career as i've been in this for you know in that business for so long 
you know, in the, in the mid eighties, I bought a Mac plus and a laser writer and a, and a, you know, and, and some software from, from Quirk to typeset, you know, software on a Mac in 86 that I spent $23,000 and it, you know, it replaced the $35,000 expense of typesetting. Everybody said the world was over when, you know, digital publishing came, right? All these great things. Well, yeah, the typesetter's job was over, the, you know, the typesetting business was out, but it opened up this whole new world for everybody to be a publisher. And so I keep seeing this over and over again, at least in my career, that this new technology comes along. There's always the doomsayer saying that, holy crap, it's over, it's going to replace people, you can't do that. And then all of a sudden it really ushers in a new, whole new age of employment. So anyway, lots to discuss. I know Robert, you have a question as well. Yeah, I have a, a question and a thought. One, uh, based on what you just said, there was a really interesting book. Some of the group may have heard it. It's called The Lights in the Tunnel. Um, it's a technologist consultant who turned economist. It's probably 15 years old now, maybe a little longer. But his basic theory is at some point, the technology right, outpaces our ability to bring the lower middle class to the middle class and keep rising up, which is kind of what you're describing. Right. And his prediction is by 2050, we'll have massive unemployment. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think, and I think Deloitte is on here, right? Deloitte's been publishing studies for the last 10 years of these are the types of jobs that may be out automated. I think we are starting to hit a cycle that's potentially different than what we have had in the past. I Humans are good. Yeah, um, humans are good, right? Go yeah. ahead. Sorry. No, no, I was just going to respond. I think that's a really good point. The speed of innovation outstrips the ability for people to learn, right? Yeah. And, to change. and, and I think that's a really, really, really valuable point. Yeah. So, so and then, I, I want to push back on, you know, I think the, the, the notion that we are all should be comfortable that this new generation of AI will create more jobs. I, I think we, we have to be very, very, I don't think it is that easy. Imagine when it was manufacturing jobs that, that were pushed out, they're like, oh, all of you should go into services jobs. All of you should go into uh, IT jobs. Now the IT jobs are being taken over, the knowledge and expertise jobs are being taken over by AI. What, where, do you, what is the next, where do you think the people are gonna go? Do we have an House cleaning. There? House cleaning, right? That's the one thing we haven't yeah, figured no, out yeah, yet. It is, yeah, yeah. It isn't that, that simple anymore. I think we have no, to be I totally agree. more, um, a little bit more inquisitive about the just questioning that old paradigm. Totally agree. And then the second point, I just wanted to jump in. Um, I'm starting to work on a new podcast and I wanted to create, uh, I needed to prototype it, right? I didn't want to borrow other people's time. And so I wrote my part and then I used ChatGPT to simulate. And then I threw it into a voice synthesizer, Murph, and created, you know, a 10 minute podcast so that I could share it with people in less than an hour and a half that I'm not suggesting that it was right. It was very kind of basic, but it was able to show the arc and literally be a podcast that somebody could listen to. And so the 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 compounding places that generative AI is playing and the different ways that you can start to use them, I think really starts to become fascinating. It's not just about text. It's not just about video. It's not just about images. It's when you actually start to combine this picture that you create movies, you create, you know, presentations. Um, you know, porn is always the first place that people go to with this, right? So it's, you know, create a scene that does X and everything just happens magically rather than actually needing exploitive workers in a way. So I think it's really fascinating how the compounded or multiplicity of this is going to play itself out. That's a that was all I would say. You guys don't know Mac Motola. He yeah. sent out a, uh, like his, his news article from Human Cloud and this blew my mind away. How many workers did you need in a large company to generate a million dollars in revenue? It is it, right now, most companies are becoming less labor intensive to generate the same or more revenue. We're getting so th this thing that this is going to create, keep creating new jobs. It's creating every wave is creating less, less skilled roles and less skilled jobs. I think it is, I, I'm not sure there's an answer to it, 
But I'm, I think with AI specifically going after services sector with manufacturing being disrupted in the past, I don't know where people will go next. There's a, uh, belongs, there's a, 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 a sort of a dated video uh, and it was on YouTube called Humans Need Not Apply. It's probably 10 yep. years old. Wow. And there was, a, there yeah, was an accompanying that. book called Rise of the Robots that talks exactly about what you're talking about. And that the fact that technology will take over jobs that can't be recreated, the whole aspect of UBI, universal basic income, all of those things that are coming out simply because you cannot replace the jobs at scale that are going to be displaced by AI. Just to, to jump in here, the, the person that wrote the book I referenced, Lights in the Tunnel, wrote the book you just referenced. Mm -hmm. So it's actually the same source referencing that for whatever that's worth. That's great. And it's a great book to listen to. Hey, hey Classic. Steve, Steve, you've been waiting to talk, and I, I always love to get Steve's perspective because he's our resident researcher doing deep research in, in, in all things, you know, talent and, and, and open talent. So any thoughts well, here? Well, I'll, I'll try to be a little more optimistic about the future. Um, the, the four words that are most wrong in forecasting is this time is different. And it doesn't mean this time is not going to be different. But um, historically, we've had mass automation wipe out mass sections of the economy. And I love the chart where Balaji's chart, I love the chart that shows the number of employees per company falling like a rock. And yet we have 50 year low unemployment rate today. And so that long-term trend hasn't killed employment. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of jobs that are going to get lost. People are going to get hurt. Um, you know, I go back to the manufacturing decline and how it destroyed many cities um, in the U.S. and around the world. And a lot of people were definitely hurt. But we also do create new jobs. So maybe this time will be different. Um, but every time we've looked at this, um, in the 1980s, bank tellers were going to disappear. And guess what? As of 2020, we had more bank tellers than we did in 1980. That trend is actually starting to fall now. In 2014, the Oxford Institute put out a study that was widely followed that said by 2020, most accountants would be out of work. Guess what? Not only do we have more accountants today, we can't find accountants. We have a shortage of accountants. And so the, the projections that this stuff kills jobs is real. Um, the question is whether it will also create jobs. And yet we're already and we're already seeing that. So I'm I'm more optimistic about the future. I think we'll have work as long as we have problems. And when I look around the world, we have a lot of problems. Yeah, we do. Yeah, that's a great that's a great insight. I love that. We'll have work as long as we have problems, and certainly we have a lot of problems. <laughs> Apology, I'm going to pass it to you since you started this off. I've got three minutes left. Any any thoughts um, to kind of bring us bring us home? Yeah, and I think we just, as given that we're all open talent um, participants in this ecosystem, um, we I challenge all of us to think about how to bring AI into our world versus competing with it and um, make it a tool for our success versus a market share, market share taker of the effort. Um, and, you know, and I think we should, all of us should think about um, how do we do that? Because as a user, I can tell you every user that is posting a project on a freelance marketplace is thinking about how much less should I pay today than I did in the past without generative AI? Mm -hmm. How can we help our freelancers to, to ride that wave versus get submerged by it? That's a great point. You know, one of the things that I wrote about in, in, in my upcoming book was in the gin and I wrote is some some statistics we found around or some research we found around, you know, the average company in the U.S. spends 0.03 percent of their of an employee's salary on job specific learning, while the average freelancer spends 15 percent of their time learning. And I, I, I have to think, or at least I want to believe that, it, you know, the world going forward is all about learners and how fast can you learn stuff and how can you use these new tools and stay ahead of the curve. If you're not learning, you're, you're, you're toast for sure. Hey, I know we're, we're at time. Um, Robert, I know you got your hand up. One, one last comment. Um, yeah, I think a key thing to look at here for the lesson is outsourcing, right? All the paradigms are very similar. Can we get low-cost labor someplace else? What does that look like? 
Um, and we know what that does to many projects, right? So I think there's really good parallels that already exist that we can learn from to bring to this. The only difference is the machine's doing it rather than a human, but we know what the client's looking for. A different kind of outsourcing. That's correct. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome conversation, guys. Thanks. Let's keep up the dialogue and reach out to each, you know, to everybody individually and let's keep it, keep it going. Look forward to hearing new thinking the next time we get together and, you know, please shoot me a note if there's uh anything that you want to connect on, or I can connect you to anybody else on the call to, to further the conversations. Thanks all. Love you guys.